everybody. Hope all is well. I know we haven't had a video in a little while. Uh, we've been covering a lot of ground, with the relocation to a new part of the country. Uh, extremely exciting uh, and really excited to uh, for all the all the changes that are happening. Have the opportunity in in the new place to uh, pursue umpiring on all three levels, and uh, I'm so excited about that. Anyway. I've uh, got a couple of videos coming out in the next couple of weeks. This is the first of two. I've uh, been asked several questions about game management clues, how to kind of walk into a situation, do a good job of assessing what you're up against or up, or what's up, uh, or what you're what you're looking at as it relates to uh, the game that's coming to you. From a game management perspective, again, all of these uh, videos are designed to help high school umpires become more savvy as it relates to game management. So. Um, like this, we're going to focus on reading tea leaves as you uh, approach a new game and specifically on coaches, the tea leaves that coaches indicate uh, that you should pay attention to as it relates to uh, game management. So good coaches say good things and good things teach players what a winning culture is. I'll explain that a little bit later. So uh, Again, just as an overview, if you haven't seen these videos in the past, they're really designed for National Federation High School context. Uh, they're really designed to help high school umpires become better or new, new umpires who are transitioning into high school from uh, lower levels, um, try, to, try to get a little bit more mentoring until they can get to school. So highly, highly, highly recommend getting to school, whether that's a, a major league school or a minor league school, um, those are available and uh, for both major league and minor league uh, academies. And then um, you've got local schools. One of the local ones here in Texas is TriplePlayUmpires.com. Uh, they recruit and train umpires who want to umpire at the collegiate level. Uh, again, wherever you're watching this from, I'm sure you've got regional umpiring uh, clinics that you can take a look at. But these videos are really designed as a bridge to those schools, you'll learn tons at the schools. Uh, and then obviously you've got your uh, master clinics uh, that your own uh, association obviously provide for you. Uh, one of the things I'm promoting on this video is a another place to source your umpire information, or excuse me, your umpire equipment. And that's umpjunksa.com. That's it's a San Antonio company that fulfills and provisions uh, uh, products for umpires uh, here in Texas, and uh, I've had the opportunity to work with them already and, and work with them, uh, buy from them uh, as, a, as a consumer already, and they are absolutely delightful and wonderful, so I highly recommend them. And then obviously Force 3 uh, Pro Gear, please, 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 as a high school umpire, do not uh, try to save money uh, on, on equipment when it comes to uh, just your gear protecting your vitals, which is your chest. And then obviously your head, uh, another vital place. So I really, really recommend that you uh, look at Force 3 Pro Gear uh, and, uh, and investigate the company. They're fantastic. Uh, learn more about their products, but uh, the, the quality of their products and the technology that they use will extend your career, especially if you're really your head and potential collisions and or uh, 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 collisions you might have with baseball. So let's go ahead and move on to, oops, sorry. So uh, they, all of these videos are built on four fundamental videos and four fundamental premises. Uh, the four pillars, if you will, of game management. Again, all of this is for you to consider, throw away, whatever you'd like to do with it. But if it adds value, then awesome. The four pillars that all of these subsequent videos are, are, are really trying to support uh, and really annex, if you will, are number one, uh, after you've gotten the rules down and you understand the book learning associated with becoming a high school umpire, then you want to get to four fundamental pillars from a game management perspective that you're able to really, really be solid at. One is your solid strike zone at the plate. The second is your mobility on the bases. The third is timing on your calls and then respect for all. If you've got those four pillars down, as it relates to self-evaluation. You've got videos you can look at that are devoted to each one of those topics. Uh, then you're in a situation where you're probably gonna have a really good experience regardless of what happens during the game, as long as your partner's on board with those pillars as well. So that's just a review. 
So we're going to talk about clues that inform the approach you're going to take to the game. And a lot of my comments are really kind of, you know, indirect are, are focused on the plate umpire, but they uh, they impact the base umpire almost as much. And it's it's really kind of the nod to the plate umpire just because that plate umpire is the umpire in charge. But you're on a team. Most of these comments focus on two man mechanics. And so what I wanted to kind of offer for you to think about, and again, all of this is for you to debate, consider, evaluate, discuss, et cetera, um, and especially in your associations or with your mentors. So this is fodder for discussion. This is not a Bible. This is not the end all be all. This is absolutely not. This is just information that's designed to help you if it can, and if it can't, that's okay. So as it relates to the clues of game management, you are responsible for game management. No one else is, you are. Uh, not the coaches, not the site director, not either of the teams. You are responsible for game management. You take full responsibility for that. Because you do take full responsibility for that, you have to evaluate your own competency or your own ability to manage the game effectively. And again, I've, I've mentioned earlier that the four pillars are a solid, are solid, being solid at the plate, solid is an acronym, mobility on the bases, timing and tempo on your calls and respect for everyone. Good coaches will make your job easier. I know that's stating the obvious and they will help you. That may not be stating the obvious, but a really good coach has an eye on everything, has great self-awareness and is also in a situation where they wanna help the umpires succeed because they understand that the umpires third team on that field that day. Bad coaches will challenge your skills. And in that respect, they will also help you. Uh, you might have some growing pains as it relates to game management, potentially managing conflict, but it is awesome experience for you to learn these skills. And there's really only one place you can actually apply them, and that's on the baseball field. You can learn them when you go to school. You can learn a little bit about them from this video, but you're really going, there's only one place where you're gonna have the opportunity to practice uh, game management skills and bad coaches are the ones that are gonna help you do that best. You know, in the corporate world, we say that our most valuable customers are the unhappy ones uh, because they bring to us the problems. They, they reveal to us the challenges that our company needs to overcome to delight all of your customers. And in the same way, your, your bad coaches are the ones that really help you progress the most, as long as you're up to the task uh, that day. And again, those four pillars are key, I believe. And so the key is to, turn, to determine which kind of coach is gonna show up that day. And that's what we're gonna focus on in this discussion. So what I would offer you for you to consider is number one, focus on the verbal cues. You're trying to figure out based on the coach's behavior, what type of team you're going to, you're going to be uh, umpiring for that day. And again, good coaches will probably lead to a positive experience. Bad coaches, not so much. Hopefully, you know, you get one of each uh, and you can split the difference. But if you get two bad coaches, um, boy, there's a lot of opportunity to grow that day. So uh, anyway, take this, uh, take this for what it's worth and uh, enjoy discussing it with your mentors and peers. First of all, focus on verbal cues, uh, the tone and type of communication to the players. If you notice before the game, obviously you're gonna arrive before the game. Uh, and in a many cases in high school, once you've got a few years under your belt, you, you know many of the coaches. You've already had experience with the coaches. But in those situations where you're showing up and you're meeting them for the first time, something I'm doing uh, based on uh, my new situation, uh, I'm, I'm really paying a lot of attention to tone and type of communication to their players. Um, how they communicate to their players is a pretty good indicator of how they will communicate with you. Um, and so that's what's waiting for you. And I'm, I'm not talking really about the plate meeting. At the plate meeting, everyone, you know, plate meeting is kind of like Christmas. Everybody's nice and, and there's peace and harmony and peace on earth and goodwill toward men. And we all get that. But once the game starts, uh, what's waiting for you after that first close call that may go against a certain team, um, that type of communication that the coach uses when, they communi when he communicates to his players is probably the type of communication that's waiting for you. So um, this, uh, several weeks back, I had the opportunity to, to do a game 
uh, and a, and a, uh, it was a uh, it was a travel ball game, and two of the two of the there were three coaches that really impressed me, and the two of them, um, specifically uh, the the first base coach and the third base coach. The head coach was on the first baseline, and I was and I had the bases, so I was in the position, and I had the chance to to say hi to him, and and he was a Dominican former Dominican he's a Dominican player. That spent uh, over 20, about 22 years in in the majors, uh, many of that in the minor league, and he was a 60 travel coach, and uh, you know, we're, and I said, hey, did you, did you play in previous years? And he looked, yeah, I don't even know what his age was. I would say over 40, but he was in great shape, and his energy, his life energy, was awesome, and he was very. And he goes, yeah. And so he told me a little bit about his MLB career. And then he said, the guy over there on third base pitched for 11 years in the majors. And I believe there were, again, I don't know for sure. I think there were Dominican players. But they were the most delightful, awesome guys. And they were so good at coaching. And their team was so solid. And they were playing a 16 tournament. And almost all their kids, all their players were 14 years. And so, and they were clocking, they were, they were playing great baseball. They were just, they were, they were clearly beating the other teams on everything, details, uh, just so they're right. Every, every player, on the, the IQ of every player on their team was, was excellent. And again, they were still growing into their bodies. So they weren't running, you know, four two forties yet, but they mentally were competing, being where they should be, trying to get where they should be making good decisions, understood um, what an approach is at the plate in terms of hunting for fastballs, uh, what what decisions to make on different types of pitches and counts. Really impressive. And anyway, we're talking between one of the early innings. He says, you know, good coaches say good things. And he goes, we don't say bad things. We just say good things. And I noticed throughout the whole game that that was true. When his kids did make mistakes, uh, they were typically physical mistakes, but when even when they did make a couple of mental mistakes, they did not say anything when a mistake was made. A lot of coaches will jump all over that and just kind of that's that door for I'm going to teach you now that you made this mistake. And and his comment was good coaches say good things. And I noticed that when his players did good things and, and by a lot of standards, they were doing great things for age 14 while they were beating up on this hero. Uh, but I was impressed at the energy and and the decorum uh, that it had. It was so great. It was what baseball should be. And he, he basically made the comment, mistakes teach players, not coaches, and, not, and, and, and don't punish players. And I kind of throw that coach's piece in because he really emphasized in our conversation the consequences. These are smart kids, and they know when they make a mistake. They don't need uh, they don't need someone else to tell them they made a mistake. And he said that 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 at practice, that's where they they go ahead and talk about you know what specific things they might have done better. But he said um, that mistakes are what teach players. Uh, that, that mistakes are not designed to punish players. So my point is that if you run into a coach that is saying those types of things when you run into a coach that has players where they talk to their that where they're talking to each other with a lot of respect and they've got some humor and they're having fun but there's an absence of berating and just piling on when something goes wrong um got some verbal cues that are yeah. focus on behavioral cues you know the, the the verbal cues will lead to behavioral cues so body language look at I kind of want to get the body language to and by the players. So the coach, whatever body language the coach has to the players, you want to, you know, just, just, and again, I'm not saying you're walking around over somebody's shoulder or stalking them before the game starts, but these are clues you can pick up on pretty fast if you stay aware of, of how things are happening before the game. And so, uh, and also the players, how do the players speak to each other? You know, if it's crickets inside the dugout, that's not a good sign. That's a bad sign. Um, and you can say, oh, no, that's focused team. They know what they're supposed to do. And, and I would respectfully offer that's, that's actually a, probably a culture of intimidation. It's probably not. It's probably a toxic culture. If you got a team before the game that's not talking to each other, um, not so good. 
So, but anyway, that's again in the same way that uh, that in the same way body language tells you about the coach and and the team. That's kind of what's waiting. That's another what's waiting for you on that first conference call. So um, you focus on play, not what you say. Uh, I had an experience about four or five years ago with um, one of the story coaches in high school uh, coaching um, Colorado history. And uh, it was an awesome, I'll try to tell this fairly quickly, but uh, I was doing a, um, a Sunday game. It was travel ball. And so this team was just a really, really solid team. But this specific coach, I was really excited to, to do the game with because he, he um, he's an older fellow. He, he had several state championships, always making it to regionals, always had teams with great decorum. Uh, again, like I said, just just a remarkable history, remarkable coach, uh, humble fellow, um, not a big talker, um, a ready smile, knows more about baseball than, his, you know, than I'll ever know. And uh, so I was, it was, I'm not, I'm not exactly sure why he was there that day. Um, I think he was kind of watching players. Um, again, I'm trying, I'm, I'm fighting for why he was there. But my, my, my point is that uh, the game started and, uh, it, and his team didn't say anything. I said, literally, there were no words coming out of anybody on his team's mouth. And I had to play. And so I uh, obviously tried to introduce myself to the catcher on the pitches, on the pregame pitches. And he just, the catcher just smiled at me and shook my hand. He was extremely respectful. He was, he was delightful, kind, you know, big smile, neat kid. And, uh, but no, no verbal <laughs> response, like, hey, my name is Chad or whatever. And so I thought, well, that's okay. It's fine. So I, I put the ball in play and I, I noticed that right away that uh, there was just no, no, nothing, nobody was saying anything. Um, and that doesn't mean that there weren't. Um, they were, you know, cheering when, it went, you know, when something went well. So cheering was okay, but actually communicating and talking was not happening. So anyway, around the third inning, I walk over to the dugout and, and uh, the other team's kind of freaking out a little bit too. They don't know what to do. By the third inning, it's pretty clear which, which, which team is superior. And so I walked over to the coach and I said, Coach, is, is there something I should know? Everybody get, you know, did big case of laryngitis last night. I mean, they'd obviously played on Saturday the day before to get into uh, the 10 o'clock game on Sunday. And uh, anyway, he smiled at me and he motioned for me to get a little closer. And so I did. And uh, he just whispered, I'll tell you after the game. And I said, OK. And I kind of whispered back, OK, you get caught up in that. But anyway, uh, there were several, several really close plays during the game. Uh, but and and I can see that the team was communicating as far as signs. I can see that they're very attentive to watching the different, you know, the different coaches, base coaches in terms of what was happening. They were so focused on their fundamentals because that's all they had to go on. They didn't have the ability to speak during the game. So anyway, long story short, is I, I talked to the coach afterwards. He uh, told me that on the previous day that he had felt that his team on a couple of plays had crossed the line as it relates to decorum and professionalism and what they had said to umpires and said to each other and said to coaches. And so he told them in no uncertain terms that, uh, that for that day, that, that game, that anyone who said anything other than cheering uh, earnestly and sincerely for another player uh, would literally be suspended from the team. And again, these were good kids. These weren't troublemakers at all, but they had just gotten caught up in the game. And for whatever reason, the game became more than a game uh, on that Saturday when they when they when he felt they crossed the line. And again, he has pretty high standards, uh, but he told me that um, this was his way of helping them understand that this game is just a game and that how you conduct yourself matters. And that the only person responsible for how you play and the ultimate outcome of the game is you. It's not an umpire and it's not the other team. It's just you are what you have responsibility over and you have impact on your teammates, but you need to learn to communicate in a way that's respectful. And if you can do it without words, then you're even better. And that's what they did that day. And they, they, uh, they five run the other team. 
But I, I guess what I'm trying to say is their body language showed what they were doing and the way they play made a statement. And that was what was waiting for me that day. So trying to focus here on, on a couple of ex examples of amazing coaches and the kind of communication that they um, fostered on their teams. And the reason for that is because the science, is, scientific advancements we're making, especially as it relates to the brain right now, are freaking amazing. And we are learning so much about behavioral sciences. And what we're learning from psychology is just awesome. And what that is, what psychology is telling us right now as it relates to athletics and performance is that if you really want to have a losing team, then be a negative coach because you're almost guaranteed that's what you'll get. But if you want to have a winning team, then be a coach that focuses on goal setting and routines and visualization and confidence and respect. Build a culture that cultivates respect and hard work and some humor and, and some camaraderie. But if you, if you, if your behavior as a, as a coach in the way, what, the way you communicate, what you communicate and your body language say to your players, that they are not, that they're on a different level, lower level, that they are not worthy of respect, that, that they're not excellent people, that uh, baseball is just a game designed to teach them how to become excellent young men through the character they develop playing this completely unfair game. <laughs> if, if, if you're gonna be that coach that raises your voice and, and demonstrates that type of negative way of communicating, you're pretty much going to guarantee negative outcomes. And so that's, it, it literally, it literally shuts down the body and it shuts down the mind to the, and you could say, Oh, that's bull crap. I've had, I had a negative coach and it was good for me. And what about boot camp and all that kind of stuff. And again, I'd invite you to go have that conversation. I'm not suggesting at all that everybody should get a, a trophy every time they breathe correctly. That's, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is these great coaches, good coaches say good things and they create great cultures because they do. And, and, and that focusing on play rather than what you say, again, according, based on my experience with truly extraordinary coaches is completely validating what the science is saying. And so when you enter a game from a game management perspective and you can hear and observe a coach that's demonstrating uh, a, a very constructive approach. Uh, you're you're, you're going to be looking for you're going to be looking at a good game, at least for that team. And if you have both coaches demonstrating that, then you're going to have a great game. We'll talk about it in a second. But anyway, we spent a lot of time here. I just want to kind of give you context that the science and the history and the experience and what really really stellar coaches are saying and doing all are in alignment when it comes to how to how you create a winning program. All right, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna go into this a little bit more depth. And uh, if this is too much detail, then just fast forward, no problem. But again, want, want to give you a little bit more color as it relates to what we're trying to say here. So the effect of saying good, and I'm gonna define good, you can define it how you wish, but I'm gonna define good as respectful. You know, there's, there's different types of coaches, different types of people, but I'm gonna define good as respectful. So can a respectful coach give, give feedback that may not be, be rosy. Sure. Sure. They can. It's, if it's respectfully done. Uh, and, and the effect of, of saying bad things, I'm going to say bad is disrespectful, disrespectful. Of course, uh, again, you can define it how you wish in my book, it has something to do with foul language being demeaning, um, and, uh, not respecting your players and really appreciating them for the, the amazing people they are and being conditional as it relates to how you treat them. If they, in other words, if you treat them good because they make a good throw and treat them badly because they make a bad throw, I'm respectfully <laughs> suggesting that's bad, bad communication. Uh, all right, so as far as the effects of saying good, respectful things, from a psychological perspective, the inputs, again, I'm not a psychologist, this is just based on my experience, take it for what it's worth or leave it. Uh, but the verbal inputs that you're trying to look for, the, the clues are reciprocal respect. So greetings, discourse, questions, 
is there is there respect on both sides of the communication with coach between the coach and the players? Positive tone. Is there transparency and authenticity and interest uh, between the coach and the, the coaches and the players? I should say coaches, multiple coaches. Um, but I'm focusing on the head coach because there's another axiom that holds in the business world that also I think holds in the, in the athletic world. And that is um, companies take on the attributes of their leader. And I think players to some degree take on the attributes of their leader. So if the leader um, is a good example, you'll have good, uh, good behavior largely on the team or in the organization. So anyway, in terms of uh, humorous undertones, um, if, if the coach and the players have a sense of humor that, uh, that illustrates that they enjoy the game and that they enjoy each other and they enjoy the culture that they have, that's, that's just a, a very respectful thing. And then mutual commitment. Uh, does, does the coach, you know, does, does what he say and what he does provide confidence to the players does it give them a sense of enthusiasm? Do they want to play the game harder, stronger, faster, better because of their respect for him? Or are they just, you know, just doing time? So those are the verbal inputs that you're listening for when you are, when the game, before the game starts and as the game progresses in the early innings to give you an idea of how you want to put your game management strategy together. Um, some of the outputs uh, from a performance perspective that you'll observe after the game begins or, or certainly during the warmups, you know, taking infield, et cetera, outfield, you can observe these things there too, but is there respect for self to the player? Does the, the player hold himself like he respects himself? You have a good self-identity. Um, is there respect for the coaches? Are the players talking about the players and their peers and their coaches in a constructive, positive way? Whether that's joking, whether that's you know nicknames, is there a sense of is there a sense of respect there? Uh, again, I'm not talking about a, a sober you know type of culture. I'm talking more about just a very healthy sense of of self worth and respect for each other. Uh, they also have respect for competitors and for umpires. Um, they really feel a sense of gratitude to be able to play this game, and they're happy to be there. And the way they treat other people is emanates from how they feel about themselves, which is, in this case, would be a positive self-identity. Uh, authentic communication and learning. So, again, authentic is a powerful word, but when they are sincerely focused on trying to acquire and, and apply new skills, uh, whether that's base running skills. I mean, the nuances of this game are amazing and deep and and. They take, a, they take a long time to learn and great coaches know how to teach them. And so when I, you know, there's a lot of communication out there that, that can be insincere, stupid, unnecessary, negative, et cetera. But what I would respectfully put forth here is that if you see authentic, earnest communication where people are asking, players or coaches are exchanging questions you know, coach, was that the right throw? What do you think about that throw in that play? Or a coach saying, hey, you know, hey, Steven, um, tell me more about what your thought process was on how you wanted to intercept that runner from based on where the, where the ball was. When, when you've got that type of communication happening, uh, you've got a good thing. Players that stay, that play as a team, lose, relax, smarter, confident, curious. It's, I know I'm stating the obvious there, but the, that's what you're looking for as clues before the game starts that tell you, regardless of how the coach comes across at the plate meeting, what's really coming your way. Uh, improvement via genuine love from uh, learning and improving, which is really a winning habit and a winning, winning, winning behavior, a winning attitude. Uh, and so that's what you're looking at. These, these, you're looking for teams that really get better almost at every at bat, that, that are get better every time they take the field, that, are trying to win every single inning, you know, and focused on, on specific goals. So the message behind these types of inputs is to you as the umpires uh, that are going to manage that game is that your game management risks are probably marginal if you and your partner don't have a perfect game because you're, you're surrounded by people who have a really good sound foundation for what the, what the game is the respect for the game and what they're trying to accomplish. Um, so I'm not saying relax too much. You can relax, but I'm just letting you know that even if you don't have your best day, 
um, you're you're probably got small risk as it relates to game management because those types of players and teams are so focused on their own accountability and their their own specific goals that they're trying to accomplish. They're not going to make you an excuse for them not improving that day. They're really just whatever you do, they're going to adapt to. They're going to say, so what? And they're going to figure out how to how to optimize that situation. And so um, what, what I mean by that is your mistakes will not be allowed to be an excuse and will be interpreted as their opportunity to learn and adapt and improve. Better way to put it, I guess I should put my own slide. Uh, to support a professional, and then, again, they're going to support a professional accountable culture uh, that uses baseball to teach boys lessons about all aspects of their life. In other words, baseball is not their life. It's just one part of their life. But they, if they're around wise coaches and wise players who understand that there's much to learn from this from this game, from, from the wisdom of the coaches. Um, preemptive game management measures are not a primary focus. So um, they, they, in this situation, if you've got two teams that, that are hitting these markers and giving you these indicators, um, what you can do is you can train novice umpires. This gives you a, a safe place, a safe atmosphere to train, uh, to train new umpires. And it also gives you the ability to learn and practice new or advanced uh, umpire mechanics. Um, so uh, the, this is a perfect opportunity, a safe opportunity for you to move outside your comfort zone and really push yourself. You know, if, if you're a plate umpire and you've got the fact that you tend to run up the third baseline um, uh, in, in, in the infield instead of in foul territory, Maybe this is that time. Maybe your your timing plays, right? Timing plays. Uh, get, um, man in scoring position on second and two outs, right? Making sure that you remember to stay behind the plate and read the play and read where the throws are coming from and make sure that you uh, are keeping an eye on the timing uh, of that third out in terms of how it's dispensed. Uh, and then enjoy the game and focus on improving your most important weaknesses. I've talked before about, you know, every single game, find one, at least one thing, not many things, but one to two things that you're really, really, really going to focus on. Again, whether it's timing uh, plays, whether it's uh, mechanics approaching third, whether it's um, if you're on the bases, you know, it's how you're going to work in the working area, whether you want to spend more time in the shallow or the deep end of that pool as it relates to getting to 60 degrees versus 45, to look for uh, touches on the backside, the blind spots that are out there between behind second and third. You know, these are all things that you choose to focus on. And these, when you see signals from teams that tell you that they say good, respectful things, you've got an awesome learning environment. Uh, and so really, really make the most of that with the two cents that I would offer you. However, if <laughs> the clues that you're observing um, say uh, bad and disrespectful things, uh, then, then here are the things you're looking for. From a verbal perspective, you're looking at, you're probably going to observe some hierarchical respect. And what that means is one, one coach is talking down to players, maybe dismissive. Uh, it, what you're looking at is curt speed, very brief, you know, short. Uh, kind of cutting comments, um, you're going to see or hear fear, uh, trepidation from some of these players. And I'm not talking just the, the younger players on the team, you probably see it across the board. Uh, you might have a couple of, you know, favorites are on the team, uh, who maybe think they're different, but you're going to, you're going to sense this pretty quick. And if you're listening into the dugout and the team is in there and you hear crickets, it's very, very quiet. You don't sense energy or have any verbal cues that these, these players really care about each other and are really excited to play. Uh, and that's really, that, that's a great clue. I had a situation last, this last summer um, where uh, one of the games was going longer. Uh, I had to follow up the next game. So I got there early and I was just uh, sitting down, uh, sitting out on, on the first baseline. And uh, the next team to play was out there sitting as a team, and, and I just and, and they came and sat next to me. I was already I was there first, and I just noticed it was so quiet. 
which was the last thing I would expect. And I noticed the coaches were sitting with them. And uh, that, that was just like this. There was a sign, it was a signal um, that that was a, a team that was run on fear and intimidation. And I, I can tell you without any reservation, that's exactly what it turned out to be. Two games I had with that team uh, the following team. Conceited tone, so again, dismissive, constrained, um, you know, stressed type of everything's important. Pick up that ball. Don't do that. You know, that's not what we do. That type of that strain in the voice that I don't know how to explain it, but you know it when you hear it. And so uh, avoiding eye contact, if you're you're seeing a lot of uh, players on the team not make eye contact with the coach, uh, negative. And if you've got a coach at the plate that's not making eye contact with you, big red flag. Uh, vital undertones. So it, if if the communication in the dugout is it, to these players is that they need to master the game today, uh, which is ridiculous, uh, then you've got stress and you've got uh, a likely situation where the first close call that doesn't go their way will obviously prove that you don't know how to umpire and that they did it. Uh, they, they, they tolerate each other in, instead of engaging each other and they blame others, you know, under, you know, talking under their, you know, talking under their breath, you know, maybe you're on the A position, you got a first baseman, and you, you got a, a ground ball that gets through the shortstop, you got a first baseman that just starts, you know, talking smack about, about the, their own team. So those are, those don't just pop up most of the time. Uh, and again, they can, you could say, well, that comes from the home and maybe it does, but in a lot of cases that comes from the first. And so just be watchful of that. Coerced motivation. So if you got a coach that's using language that uses guilt and shame and mercurial, mercurial messaging, what I mean by that is, is and if a player makes a good play, they're awesome uh, or they're adequate. But if they make a bad play, then they're, they're a lousy person. They get treated like crap. So when you got a coach that doesn't have a, a consistent way of treating their players with respect, regardless of how they play, um, and makes the game seem more than a game, um, and unnecessarily so, uh, I get that there are big games and there are big plays. I'm not saying there aren't. I'm just, I think you understand what I'm saying about um, a career messaging. Uh, and and if, if you hear just a sense of stress and everything, right? And, and what you're not hearing at all here is any humor, any any brotherhood type language, et cetera. So those are the verbal um, clues that you will pick up. And again, you won't need much time. You'll need a couple of minutes in most cases to pick all this stuff up. I'm just trying to get a lot of detail so that you know what to look for. Um, outputs uh, that are driven by this type of communication have to do with uh, behaviorally disrespect for anyone they disagree with, uh, whether it's a pitch they don't like or a call they don't like. Um, fits are the, the easiest thing. You know, if you got a player that's going to throw a fit, you've probably got a coach that's going to throw a fit. Uh, and foul language. Um, so those, again, those come from the top down most of the time. Uh, and if, if the coach doesn't uh, have uh, tolerance for that type of uh, kind of juvenile behavior and, and irresponsible or unprofessional behavior, then you won't see it. But if they do have a lot of tolerance for that, then that tells you a lot about, again, your, your game management strategy. Most importantly, if you, if you see them using you as an umpire as an excuse, uh, instead of respecting you, then uh, again, pretty easy stuff to read. Those are the easy, big, you know, red signs behaviorally. Compromised listening, impairing learning, impaired learning. So if you've got this type of environment, right, on a team, what you'll typically find is that the team plays worse and worse and worse throughout the game. They may hang in there for an inning or two or three, but at some point they're going to crack because something's going to go wrong because that's the nature of baseball, right? That's why we play the game. That's why we umpire the game, because it's like life. No matter what you do to prepare, something is going to change that you don't anticipate. It's going to test your ability to adapt in a professional and respectful and curious and innovative way. So uh, when, when you have an environment where bad 
disrespectful things are communicated, especially by the coaches, you're going to see poor baseball and you're going to see losing baseball and it's going to get worse and worse. It won't get better and better. And so that's another indication. And that's another reason why preemptive game management is critical. Your ability to, to manage the fourth inning and the first inning is what I mean by preemptive game management, taking measures early on quietly and precisely to ensure that nothing escalates and they preempt anything from spinning out in your innings. So players that play, you'll also see, again, the psychology and the science that we just saw in the previous slide, it bears this out. When you have this type of culture of negativity and disrespect, it produces players that play tight, that play afraid, they're timid, selfish, talent-centric, instead of team-centric. Um, it's just, these are the attributes of that culture, and you see it. Um, improvement is sold or intimidated. What I mean by that is how many of these coaches, especially with a lot of these travel um, brands, you know, these, uh, some of these, some of these um, franchises, especially travel squad franchises, uh, I know up in Colorado, there's one that's got like 68, 60 different teams. And players, if I remember correctly, players, all the way from middle school up to high school, 60 teams, and I guess 30 of them is what I was told were in the high school level. But every one of those players is playing, is paying, well, at least last year, was paying 7,500 bucks to play a summer and either a fall or a spring. So you get it. And, and, and so many of these coaches um, are, are, are selling themselves rather than coaching. So they're, they're selling to the to the to the parents that they played here or they played this way or they just knew so and so or you know this is so they're really selling themselves or they're intimidating the players into thinking they know more about baseball than they do and maybe they have great baseball knowledge there's a lot of people with, I would imagine with great baseball knowledge you don't know how to communicate it well coaching is completely different than intellect. And uh, again, I'm not telling you anything you don't know, but this is, this is again, something to understand as you look at game management and look at the signs. Uh, and so if you've got a coach, uh, especially up at the dish, or if you're listening to the way that he communicates with players uh, and it's about him, then, then it is it's about him. And you, 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 gotta, you, gotta, you gotta be ready to manage that. Um, so, my point here is the stats always tell the truth. And so um, in these types of environments, these types of cultures, regardless of what's sold or posted or communicated, uh, you probably got a losing team and you've got a team that's going to lose worse at the end of the game than it's in the beginning of the game and to peel out and implode based on that culture. So the message for you as an umpire is that game management risks are significant if you and your partner have a perfect game, uh, their mistakes uh, as players, as a team, are unavoidable. That's why they play the game. No one plays a perfect game. Uh, and will be interpret and, and their mistakes will be interpreted as your mistake. So you will become an excuse because that's the culture they live in. And they're looking for reasons why their amazing skills didn't work in a given situation. And the coach is also going to amplify that uh, or may amplify that. Uh, and they use base and, and those coaches in those situations, we, they, they use baseball to teach boys that baseball defines and matters more than any other aspect of their life. It's all about baseball and anything that happens in a baseball game matters more than anything else, as opposed to, hey, it's a part of life and learn from it, adapt and move on. So. What you need to understand, or what I would ask you to understand, is your preemptive game management measures are a primary focus. When you have these clues, these inputs and these outputs, when you look over at the dugout, when you listen to the dugout, when you watch the pregame, when you, when you see in a matter of minutes these types of flags going up, you are being told what you should do from a preemptive game management perspective. So what do you do? First thing you do is you raise focus on the preemptive umpiring strategies and collaborative communications. So you are you and your partner or partners are 
very much focused on making sure that you do not let anything ride uh, past the first or second inning. Things that are happening in the first or second inning that should not be happening. Um, it's not a one-off. It's not a mistake. It's not a whoopsie-daisy. It's you have to treat it as intentional. So one thing that you might consider, for example, is if in the first inning, you know, say at the plate meeting, you've explained to the teams, you know, the tempo matters that when you're in the box, unless you got a medical issue or you're getting frozen out, you want to stay in the box and play the game, right? A lot of these lesser teams, a lot of teams that have these negative, bad, and disrespectful cultures, you know, they're, uh, you know, they may have certain, certain behaviors like this where they just, they like to mess with the pitcher a lot and get in and outside the box. They like to get into the box with their hand up and call time every time and blah, blah, blah. So you've communicated at the plate that that's not what we're doing, that we're playing real baseball. We're playing with tempo, we're playing with um, decorum. And when you're in the box, you're ready to play. So be in the box. And, uh, and so of course they test you in that first inning. You wanna go ahead and address that right away. And again, based on the four pillars, uh, the way you would consider doing that is, you know, the first time it happens, you go ahead and uh, as, if, they, if, if they haven't checked the box in terms of it's not a medical issue and they're not getting frozen out by the by the by the um, pitcher, then that you should interpret that as disrespect for what you've communicated the plate and you call time and you quietly, uh, not quietly, but you calmly walk over to the head coach, say coach. Um, we had this conversation. We want people in the box ready to play. Um, that's that's it, it, there's something that was misunderstood about that. And and then you've communicated it, and now you can go back to the plate and you can do what you need to do in terms of executing the rules, which is to to let the pitcher pitch and let the game play. And if they want to step outside the box with the pitch thrown, uh, the batter does. Then there are rules that will go ahead and indicate what needs to happen there. But you want to address that early innings, not late innings. But that's an example of, of making sure that you don't have a big blow up in the fourth inning because you call it for the first time and enforce it for the first time in the fourth inning. That team that does, that says bad and disrespectful things, they will make a massive issue of it. So that's an example of, of making sure that you and your partner are very preemptive in terms of how you're going to approach the game with clear expectations and clear and respectful um, communication. Again, these are the teams where you do not want to yell across the diamond to a coach of this team. You want to speak to them face-to-face, eye-to-eye, in close proximity, and in calm tone. And the more that you do that, the more you demonstrate your decorum and your professionalism, and the more you illustrate to that coach that you are tenured and that you are very capable of managing the situation. Um, and so the other thing you want to do is relax. Let the game come to you. When you see that you've got one of these types of coaches, especially in a big game, uh, you may have a tendency or you have some, maybe not a tendency, you may just get some anxiety as, as, a, as you know, you're anticipating there's going to be some conflict and there, there may, there probably will be. <laughs> But you're trained, you're with a partner, you're a team out there. Um, if luck's on your side, the other coach is a good coach that says good things. You've only got one team and one coach that you've got to focus on that day. But uh, I would just in- encourage you to get your breathing right, uh, relax, and most importantly, like I said, let the game come to you. Don't let anxiety make you think you've got to go find something. It will come to you and you will know based on your training what to do in the right situation in every situation. And again, you're a team, you've got a partner out there and you've had a pregame and you've talked about how you're going to go ahead and approach specific situations. So again, relax. Um, It will potentially be a a more challenging game from a game management perspective, but that's okay. It's gonna make you a better umpire. It's gonna give you opportunities and scenarios to apply uh, decorum and professionalism um, that you might not otherwise have. It's good. Uh, elevate professionalism via demonstrated competency. So uh, I come back to the four pillars. Make sure you know those. Make sure that you focus on those. And if you only focus on four things that day, focus on those four things. Talk. You know, focus on being 
uh, solid at the plate. Focus on being mobile on the base. Focus on getting your timing and tempo right. And make sure that you, above all, people on that field that day illustrate what respect and decorum looks like. So those, that's a lot of color and probably you know, more time than some of you wanted to spend. Uh, but let me try to wrap it up here in, in, a, in, a, in a more simplified slide. So if a coach says bad things to players, he and his team will treat, uh, will treat you badly. It's just a matter of time. Culture he's creating psychologically fosters trepidation, arrogance, bad mistakes, really, really, really bad mistakes, life-altering mistakes, everything's so serious, and will produce losses most likely. And you, the umpire, are going to be the excuse of choice. That's just the fact. So what? So your game management skills are likely to be tested. That's fine. Do your job and keep it simple. Make sure that you nail the four pillars and preemptive attention that day. We talked about that in the last 30 minutes, but that's a cap, that's capsulized. So tips, right? So things that you can think about um, and apply. Number one, be preemptive. So I've given you some examples about you know, how to be, what you want to be preemptive about. And much of that communication will happen at the plate, at the plate meeting. And uh, number two, know your five steps, right? You know your five steps in dealing with a coach or specific coaches. So make sure those are close. And, and by the way, know how you're going to apply those. And, and most importantly, know how you're going to communicate those, right? So when you ignore, you ignore. When you acknowledge, you acknowledge. When you warn, you warn. When you restrict, you restrict. And finally, you eject. Um, you obviously want to have a good understanding of when and how to apply those and, and how you intend to apply those. But I would focus on how you communicate more than anything else. Please keep your proximity to the coach when you communicate five, you know, in a, in a COVID world, it's six feet. But I, I, I would make sure that there's that you're close to the coach, that you're talking in a tone of voice that is calm and that is clear that your body language is open and that, that you are not inviting a lot of emotionally charged words or communication behavior into that into any of those five steps. Um, number three, uh, controlled communications. Again, we just talked about distance, tone. Uh, and tempo is another thing. When people get in situations where they're managing conflict, they tend to talk really fast like this. And what I would invite you to do is practice talking slow and let the coach finish his sentences when you're speaking to him. But then once he's spoken, let him say one thing once and that's it. And then go play baseball. Finally, um, let the game come to you. Uh, I mentioned it earlier, but it's, it's something that that phrase is so valuable, I think, to young umpires, new umpires, especially in high school. Um, I think it's valuable for everybody. Can you, I mean, I remember the phrase when I was in school of, uh, uh, one of the umpires there who would, who would uh, call World Series games. And, you know, his stories were awesome. They were so great. But one of the things he emphasized was that in, as big as those games are, and as big as the personalities are that are playing in those games and the level of skill and the, and the, uh, you know, the feeling in the stands, and the, it's just amazing. But at the end of the day, you need to just trust your skills Trust your teammates out on the bases and let the game come to you and be prepared. Uh, if, the coach, if a coach says good things to players, which is so awesome, and uh, <laughs> it's not nearly as common as it should be. I know that's a harsh thing to say, but um, again, coaches are learning too. But uh, he probably won't talk to you that much, um, and neither will anyone else, <laughs> because they're really not focused on you at all, uh, and that's awesome. Um, regardless of what you do, they're going to take full responsibility for whatever the situation is, whether the call goes their way or not. Their, their focus will be on learning from the experience and how best to adapt to it and how to do better next time. Uh, and so that's the beauty of, of umpiring games with teams and coaches that say good things and create those powerful, accountable, wonderful cultures. Uh, he's creating a culture that psychologically fosters confidence, and respect. All mistakes are good uh, because they learn from them and, and typically they will win. And typically they will play better over the course of a game, not worse. 
in contrast, teams that stay badly. And you, the umpire, are appreciated, and they even understand that you're learning too. Um, I've, had, uh, I've had so many really cool experiences in the short time that I've been doing minor league ball, uh, and and many great, really, really good experiences in the last five or six years doing fall college ball. But I can say that in the minor leagues, that most, almost every conversation um, that that I've that I've had, or that you may you may have when you get to that level too. I've just been shocked at how many at how many conversations with, with the uh, with the coach. I, again, uh, it's the manager, by the way, and you're always calling them by their first name, uh, which is an awesome thing. Once you get there, um, first name basis. It's, a, it's about respect. But when 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 there's a call and and it's it's a close call, I've been absolutely delighted to find out that when the manager comes over to talk about it. Um, it's always in close proximity. It's always in respectful tones. And most of the time, they just want to talk about the weather or they'll, if they don't know you yet, they'll say, hey, listen, I, uh, I think you got that call right, uh, but I want my team to believe that I'm passionate too, which I am. So I'm passionate that I wish we would have gotten that play in our favor, but I, I want you to know that I'm just talking to how much I love my players and, and so we're done. <laughs> so um it's i i i those those experiences if you want to go that far are ahead of you um and they're they're awesome they're just awesome so what so your game management skills are not likely to be tested i enjoy your job that day it doesn't mean do worse it doesn't mean let your guard down in terms of don't do a, a professional job you want to you want to focus on specific skills and get better every single game that's i'm saying that but i'm just saying that from a game management perspective uh when you've got two coaches and two teams that have this type of a culture where they say good things um that you are probably going to have an excellent excellent day and you might even make some friends so that's where you want to apply you know stretching your skills and mentor others and i talked about that a little earlier but I would really ask you to stretch your skills. So I'm not telling you to stress yourself out, but I'm telling you that that's an opportunity for you in a safe environment to really say, man, I'm going to get better at these three things today. You know, I'm going to get, if I got a two man system and I've got a force play slide rule and I'm on the bases, I'm going to get to 60 degrees, you know, and I'm going to, I'm going to play, I'm going to play and be back a little normal, normal than I would normally, or, you know, that's where you do things different, better, or you try some things that your mentors have shared with you that they believe would help you. Um, that you really are on the basis, you know, getting really acquainted with the different, uh, different parts of the, the working area in terms of shallow versus deep. Um, and, uh, and, and, um, that's it's a lot of fun to know that you can try new skills and do it in a safe safe environment and uh so anyway i'll leave that up there and and that's your synopsis um so here's the man in the mirror comment right here which approach do you use as a mentor to umpires so uh think about it for a second you know when you've been mentoring other umpires that are coming up and you 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 know they've asked if they've asked you for your feedback your guidance or Maybe your assigner says, hey, today I'm going to assign you a newbie and I want you to do your best with them and help them come along. You know, ask yourself what kind of communication style you have, you know, and, and, and use a mirror instead of a window. Really look hard at, you know, are you giving, are you a bad communicator? You say bad things thinking that they're valuable or you say good things um, and believe they're valuable and how to, you know, take the coach out of it and put yourself in that situation. and where you land and uh you can tell you can tell the effect of your communication by looking at the person that you're with. the other empire you're working with is not making eye contact after you know the second or third inning what have you um if you don't ask to jump anymore because you're giving them so much feedback and you're all you're just burdening them with so much stuff uh or you know or maybe they're really excited and maybe they're Giving you more than one signal on a given play because they're they're really amped up about learning. You know, whatever the situation is, you can look at the way that that, that person responds to the and you can 
tell right away what kind of are in with the future. So I'd ask you or I challenge you to, to look at yourself that way and, and see what kind of person you are. And if you're feeling really brave, you know, ask ask your mentors and ask your peers what kind of communicator you are. Um, one thing I would offer to you is that when you are mentoring umpires in a game, um, you know, don't talk to them about every single thing you see they can do differently. And I use the word differently intentionally. Um, maybe maybe it's better, maybe it's not. Maybe the way you did things is better, maybe it's not. So you're inviting them to try some things based on you know, watching them for an inning or two, or maybe they come to you before the game starts and say, hey, you know, this is my level of experience in the pregame. This is what I want to work on. And you're like, awesome, let's do that. But my point is, you know, two, you know, before the game starts, pick two or three things, three max, but that's it. And then let that umpire apply a couple of things because they, you don't want to make them a great umpire in one game. You want, to, you want them to become a great umpire over two or three or 400 games. The game's way too complex. For anybody to master it fast. So give them the benefit of having a few things they can work on that they can really get better at. And then after the game's over, if they ask you for feedback, then give them feedback. If they don't ask you for feedback, don't give them feedback. That's that's something I would offer. So what are some illustrations of amazing coaches? Uh, well, you'd have to start, I think, with Mike Martin over at Florida State. Um, he uh, is the only guy on the list, as far as I know, that averaged 50 wins every single season. Um, I, I think uh, Augie came in at 49.9 or something like 49.3. Anyway, uh, Mike Martin, if you learn about him and read about him, <laughs> pretty amazing guy who said things. And uh, so I give you this slide and give you some content highlighted some of the things that J.D. Drew said about his coach. Um, and they are uh, pretty amazing things. I'll tell you, if, if your mentees talk about you the way that J.D. talks about um, his coach, uh, Mike Martin, done a hell of a job. But uh, focused on fundamentals and the nuances of the game. But he, uh, he was every practice, um, every game, his, his recipe for winning really came down to, you know, being reviewed, dug out. And it was focused on pitching, defense, and base running. And you know what's missing there, obviously, is hitting. And um, I don't, I'm not saying it's missing. I'm just saying, but he doesn't mention that as the key to success. The most successful baseball coach in NCAA history um, is asked what his secret to, to coaching was. Number one, he was always a teacher. He never saw himself anything but a teacher. So that created a, a platform of respect always. Uh, because that, that created a, a platform for learning and respect and authenticity. But I just thought it was fascinating that he did, he was more successful than anybody else. And he did it without a, a primary focus on offense. And I don't have an answer for why. I just thought that, you know, his focus on those three things was, was fascinating. So take that again uh, as something to consider. Uh, let's see. Uh, Augie, I've got in memoriam on, on the first slide. So obviously in Texas, Cal State Fullerton, uh, another amazing and storied coach. Uh, so to recap the four pillars that you want to be really, really solid, um, proficient at before you go into a game where you're really going to be tested from a game management perspective and the way you're going to be tested, you're going to know you're going to be tested by the signs and signals, and clues that you pick up from the coaches, the respective teams and their dugouts. Number one, you want to have a solid zone at the plate. You want to have mobility on the bases. Make sure you've got your angle and your distance in on every play. Uh, make sure you've got an open tag window when you make your calls. Timing and tempo, make sure you're composed. Make sure that you are not rushed on your calls. And then respect. Uh, respect that you bring uh, to the team again will be amplified or not by others based on how they so anyway that's it uh, i hope this was something that was a little bit helpful and i wish you the very very best uh, there'll be some more content coming out throughout the balance of the year uh, but uh, i hope as you uh, as a new umpire uh, or a mentoring umpire or an aspiring umpire in the high school ranks that uh, you have a chance to kind of sit back and think about you know what types of clues you see before a game starts, 
uh, as it relates to how a coach communicates based on the assumption that uh, it's everything starts from the top, behavior, words, attributes, characteristics, character, um, and what you can pick up in terms of those clues and how you can take those clues quickly and uh, create a game management plan that will be effective in helping everyone enjoy that baseball game under your guidance as, as the umpire in chief and your partner uh, for that game. All is good. Hope you have an awesome, awesome uh, season. And um, I hope you have the opportunity to discuss these things, whether they're uh, with your associations or with your peers or with, uh, what have you. And I hope that they create some great dialogue. Like I said, these are not presented as a, a biblical right or wrong. These are presented as something you can consider, discuss, and apply to the extent that it helps you improve. Thanks so much and take care.